The Impact Lounge is the number one place to be for the real Impact Wrestling fans. Hello, welcome back to another Impact Lounge review of last week's Impact Wrestling. I'm your host, Adam, and as always, I'm joined by Ro. How are you, Ro? I'm great, Adam. Glad to hear you back, man. Delighted to be back. Uh, it's, it feels like it's been months since I've been on the show. Uh, and thanks to BQ for filling in uh, in my absence. And as regular listeners will know, the reason why I, I haven't been on is that I was at the Twitch show in Manchester. Uh, I don't know. Was it? What was the name of it? Was there a name for the Twitch show? I can't remember. Um, yeah, I can't remember it either. Impact versus UK or something like that. Whatever it was. Anyway, it was excellent. Really, really good. And uh, uh, I'm sure we'll might dive into a few things when uh, during this review today. But uh, if you haven't checked it out, I would absolutely go and have a, a look at that show. There were some fantastic matches on there. Specifically, the LAX one was very good. The Su Young one. And and the main event was just was amazing. Uh, where we had Sammy Callahan versus... Um, I can't think of his name now. Uh, what's his name? Uh, the British hardcore guy. Hey, it'll come back to me. Uh, Jimmy <laughs> Havoc, right? Hardcore. Yes, that's it. Um, Jimmy Havoc, yeah. And it was it was really, really good. Some things that i never seen before. You know, sometimes you see those uh, moves, you know, where they get a staple gun and you think, oh, there's nothing, there's no staples in that. Um, well, on this show, I thought exactly the same. And I was with a friend who wasn't a wrestling fan, those kind of things. And uh, he said to me, there's no staples in there, is there? And I went, no, it's not. And then, of course, they started stapling bits of paper to Jimmy Havoc's arm and head. <laughs> and, oh, wow. and obviously, there was staples in there. So it was very, very good and very entertaining. And uh, I believe they've got another match coming up. I don't know if it's a Twitch special or whether it's uh, maybe on uh, MLW or something like that. But they're facing off each other again in another hardcore match. Uh, which always makes me laugh because it doesn't matter how you dress up these things. We've talked about this before. Same with LAX and the OGs, you know, they've got a concrete death match, you know, at, at Bang for Gory, but let's face it, it's just a hardcore match with a different name. Uh, and, and it always makes me chuckle, you know, when, you know, the other team you know, looks on in horror. Oh, my God, not not a concrete death match. <laughs> uh, and it's exactly the same as a 5150 street rules and whatever matches they had so far. It's exactly the same. So anyway, um, yeah, glad to be back. Glad to be back. And sorry for, for talking so quickly and so uh, so much at the beginning of this show. So if this is your first time stopping by, make sure you hit that subscribe button. Um, hopefully you're going to enjoy what we put together here. Uh, at uh, the Impact Lounge, and there's lots of other content on the channel, not just this weekly review. Although, to be fair, Ro and I mainly do the reviews. We do some other content now and again as well. Uh, but if you haven't already done it, also make sure you check out the Impact Lounge on Facebook and on Twitter. We've been doing a, a bit of a market survey of our listeners to find out the content that you like. And uh, yeah, so make sure you, you, you fill in that survey just to give BQ an idea of the content going forward for the channel. I don't think the reviews are going to change. You'll be glad to know. So you'll be getting your fix of uh, Ro and myself going forward. So what do we do around here at the Impact Lounge uh, on these review shows? Well, we usually ask you a tr trivia question, which Ro's going to get to in a second from last week. And uh, then we have a, we answer some of your questions from the, the YouTube comments that are usually kicking around, which are uh, talking of which I forgot to check this week. So hopefully Rose got something lined up on that one. Uh, and then we, we dive into the, the show proper, usually starting, well, for now, uh, with the main event. So uh, trivia question. Let's get straight into it. Uh, what, what, what did you have for us last week? I think there was only one idiot who got it wrong last week. <laughs> I mean, everyone universally got it right, but the answer was Ali. Um, I think what probably gave it away was between the apprentice who who's uh, who who whoever she was under had an infatuation with a Hall of Famer, which is was Maria feuding with Gail Kim. And then obviously the team that I'm a part of were night and day in terms of personality, the Demon Bunny. So Ali and Rosemary, I didn't realize how easy it was. You know, until <laughs> after the fact, I think BQ pointed it out to me. So, congratulations to everybody who got it right. Well, I was going to say, it, you can't believe how easy it was. As I said, this buffoon at the end of the line here today got it wrong. I, I was convinced it was a piss. But there you go. What do I know? <laughs> what do I know? I'm only on uh, the number one station for Impact News doing the review, and I can't even get the trivia question right. So, there you go. All right. Uh, I'll give you one this week. Um, and I don't know if it's going to be easy or not, 
The reason why I think it might be easy is that it only happened a year ago, uh, the question I'm going to ask about. But uh, the reason why it may be slightly more problematic is that most people will want to have forgotten all about this. And uh, it had absolutely zero impact on anything. So here's the question. Um, around, was it Slammiversary time? I think it might have been just before Slammiverse, uh, Slammiversary time last year. Uh, Chris Adonis and Eli Drake entered into a feud with two reality stars who, for all intents and purposes, were uh, bodybuilders and had a show on pop. The question is, what was the name of the show? There you go, quite simple. So who did Eli Drake and Chris Adonis have a feud with and what was the name of their TV show? So uh, do you know that one, Ro? Oh, well, I thought it would be easier than that. If you only think, okay, that's good. Interesting, interesting. Right, so that's the trivia question out of the way. And of course, if you leave your answer in the comments section uh, on the YouTube video, we will uh, give you a thumbs up, thumbs down uh, on your answers and let you know next week and uh yeah uh, hopefully it's slightly more difficult than, than than last week's so have we got any comments any questions for us i got it's a comment and i think this is going to piggyback off of the news that we heard most recently and bq did a video on it so be sure to check that out you guys where he kind of further elaborated on wwe meeting with impact management and I, I guess the one comment we got from Lee Poland is he was just voicing his displeasure about not wanting them to partner up in fear of WWE ruining Impact. And before I get your thoughts, I'll just uh, give you mine. You know, if it can help the company financially, because unfortunately it was released that Impact's not making the money that you know we all were hoping. You know, as great as the tapings were, they're still not making the money that we all envisioned now whether that's true or not we don't know you know i'm not trying to say i'm over here trying to count their pockets but you know, obviously as great as it is you'd like you know for them to be doing successful financially so if a partnership can help in that aspect i'm all on board but i guess the little fear that i do have is in i know i always reference wcw ecw a lot on these reviews but I remember when there was a point in time where the then WWF, they were partnering with ECW, showcasing ECW talent on WWF programming because ECW was on a tight budget. You know, they weren't in all terms of financially secure. So they were kind of doing them a favor and then only years later to get bought out by WWF. Now, I know obviously with this partnership, if anything, they're probably looking more in lines of the tape library so maybe taking some of the material from your aj styles your samoa joe's uh bobby rubes all the guys that they pretty much got over there so they can be able to build uh dvds for so i guess in terms of that there's not really a problem i don't see too much of a big deal about it but you know it's, it's kind of i don't know i i really like impact being a competitor to them even though i know they're not really one but in terms of teaming up I mean, if it's going to help them long term and financially, then I have no problem with it. Yeah, pretty much word for word what you said there, Ro, uh, for my, my view on it is that uh, exactly the same, that they need to get eyes on the product. And if that means by doing so on the WWE network, that then, OK, that's fine. But the last thing I want is, is for uh, Impact to be owned by WWE in any shape or form. I want them to be a completely separate entity with their own creative, their own management, their own finances, those kind of things. So I don't mind if it's a, it's a bit of a, uh, you know, uh, putting some stuff on the network, but at no point do I want to see them as part of uh, uh, Titan Towers over in Connecticut. Yeah, I mean, I know some people were stating because the GWN network, let's face it, I mean... As great as it is, it's not really succeeding like I think what the vision was. I mean, I I don't know about you, but I had thought maybe they were going to use it as a tool to actually have the pay-per-views when they have their events, have them on the GWN app. But really, it's just a lot of old content. And I mean, there's only so much old content that somebody's going to subscribe. And even though the $7.99 price isn't a whole lot, but if you're not getting fresh content, what incentive is it to get the get the app, let alone we watch on Impact week in and week out? Sometimes they give us full-on matches where there's really no need to purchase, purchase the uh, app. So, 
you know, I, I don't know. It just remains to be seen. We got to see how it all plays out. But I'm in agreement with you as well. Like, in no shape or form do I want to see Impact episodes airing on the WWE Network. Because at the end of the day, if you're a fan of Impact, and there's, you know, wrestling fans that watch various promotions, that's one thing. But if I'm an E-fan, and I'm only E-fan, and I don't like Impact why am I going to, if I'm not already watching it on pop YouTube or all these other platforms, what incentive do I have to watch it on the network? Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, the, the network thing's a strange one because as you said, I thought that you would find that you would get the pay-per-views on there. Um, but I think that the problem is, is that Anthem also owns the fight network, doesn't it? So I'm guessing it owns the fight app, which is where the pay-per-views do show. Right? Like, maybe I'm completely wrong on this. Yes, correct. So I'm guessing... So I'm guessing them, you know, they basically, uh, you know, don't want to shit in their front yard and, and you know, drop their revenue from from the fight app, uh, you know, and double up on it. So um, it, I can see why they haven't done it. But at the, at the same time, you know, w when it was first muted, you know, I, I mean, I, I don't use the app very often. I, I check out Impact on there, but that's about it. So, you know, I don't really know about the other content on there. But, you know, I always thought it was going to be where you're going to have other uh, promotions, shows on there, you know, the likes of, MLW and Border City Wrestling, you know, all, all these kind of shows. I, I thought their pay-per-views were going to be appearing on the GWN app. And, and I think in the early days, that's what they did. And they might still do, because I said I don't use it. But it, it seems that there's been less and less important on the GWN app these days. And, and um, just a footnote, I, I noticed on the news that the Wrestling Observer was the one who said that, you know, the meeting took place. But then Dave Meltzer, in his brilliant professional journalism style, then came out and said uh, that it was WWE who asked for the meeting and it wasn't Impact. So that's quite interesting. But um, but no news has come out of the meeting yet. Uh, the reason I laugh is Meltzer's brilliant, isn't he? He, he? If there's a bigger asshole in wrestling, I don't know who it is. I, I can't stand Meltzer. Meltzer, if you're listening, hit the unsubscribe button, please. I don't want you listening to me, okay? Although you can learn a thing or two. His reporting's terrible. There was a meeting that may or may not have taken place. And uh, during that meeting, they may have discussed uh, something about the network or sharing talent, but nothing's been confirmed, says a source. That's the kind of reporting he does. It's nonsense. Yeah, Honestly. It, 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 you know what? I think what he does, and we see this a lot when people who might not really have ties to, and I'll, I'll use sports, for example, they might not have ties to a particular team, but they have some sort of source where they're getting their info, where they can, it's kind of, in other words, like clickbait, because you know, the moment that you heard them meeting, you know, right away, people are going to insinuate, they're either trying to purchase the company, or something with the tape library, for all we know, like I, I had thought, well, not that I had thought, but I figured I seen somebody uh, suggest that they thought maybe they were going to do some sort of exchange similar to what they did years ago where I, for, I forgot what it was, but pretty much they allowed Christian to appear on one of the TNA pay-per-views after he was already signed with WWE. So I had kind of thought, well, maybe they're doing something where, hey, they're going to sell them some of the library and maybe they get, you know, whether I don't think AJ, but say somebody that's over there that probably not prominently featured on tv they get them to appear at bound for glory some some sort of a exchange of that magnitude which i said oh okay you know that's fine but once again we never we don't know the facts you know it just kind of like it was put out there and you know you know people were able to jump to conclusions just, just i think it was i've got a feeling it was rick flair being inducted into the hall of fame i've got a feeling it was the, the talent exchange for christian i think for memory no, I'm, I'm serious. I think that's what it was. Because I, I think Flair was in TNA at the time or contracted them or something like that. So I think it was, I'm sure it was Flair going into the Hall of Fame as one of the four horsemen, I think. Oh, and that's why he... yeah, no, but I know there was one with Christian too, though. I know what you're talking Yeah, I but yeah, Christian came about. the other way and, and Flair went to WWE. I think that was the talent exchange at that point. Uh, I might be wrong. Uh, listeners, you'll know, you'll, you'll remember. So uh, let us know anyway. So, yeah, so what have we learned so far on this podcast? Uh, one is that you should, shouldn't should listen to, to Dave Meltzer. <laughs> Two, uh, the trivia question is about something that you want to forget. And, uh, yeah, that's it. That's about it. Hopefully we'll be more productive going forward. Anything else in the comments there, Ro? No, that was pretty much the popular one. 
Yeah. So, uh, as we pointed out, if you do want to ask us a question, we'll be more than happy to tackle it next week uh, on next week's show. Just leave us a comment in uh, the YouTube section where you're listening to this show at this very moment. But, of course, you can listen to it on your Apple Podcasts and all these other places as well. So, uh, however you listen to us, make sure to give us thumbs up, thumbs down. We really don't care. Uh, just one final thing about Meltzer. Sorry, I'm getting back on the on my soapbox. Um, you said about him maybe not having the contacts, so he makes up clickbait and stuff like that. I, I was actually talking to someone at Anthem, and it was it was you know an off the record kind of chat, and I'm not going to divulge who it was, what was said, and those kind of things. And I, I know I'm, I'm straying into Meltzer territory here uh, of of not giving any solid evidence, but the impression that I got is that they wanted to to leave Pop was was the impression that I got. And that we're looking at things and and working behind the scenes to get something done. So uh, there you go, exclusive for you all. Um, of, of course, you know this guy was the janitor at Anthem. No, no, it was a senior member of, of someone in the Anthem team who told me this. So there you go, a little bit of a a uh, well, scoop for you guys. Right, so let's dive into the show. And uh, yeah, we had Impact coming in from Mexico. Before we start, though, what did you think of it? You know, I thought it was fine, but. There's really nothing must see and you know, I'm not going to overreact because I know we got another show coming up and hopefully that'll be the one that's a little bit better. But I don't know, I just kind of feel like with these tapings being in Mexico, they need to do something big. And I felt like this show, it felt more instead of it feeling like an actual episode of Impact, it felt like Impact invading Mexico. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I said to you before the start of the recording tonight that, uh, it felt like a Twitch show to me. It, it didn't feel like an Impact episode. Uh, and I think that had a lot to do with the fact that it was a lot of random matches in the grand scheme of things, you know, that the feuds didn't really continue, although they did, but, you know, the matches didn't continue the feuds. It was the things that happened around the matches. So, uh, yeah, it was, it was it was interesting, and there was nothing wrong about it. The crowd were great, but it wasn't my favourite show, uh, if I'm being uh, brutally honest. So, um, since I left uh, for a few weeks, you guys have changed things around, and, and apparently we now start with the main event first to make sure the listeners stay around and uh, tune in each week. So, uh, give us your thoughts on, on the main event before before we we get, dive into the rest of the show. Um, as far as the main event, Hardy, I'm just trying to bring it bring it back up. I'm following. It was a Tejano uh, versus Austin Aries. I thought this was the worst opponent to have Austin Aries go up against. I mean, I think Phantasma would have worked better. I think he would have put on more of a compelling match and would have been a more of a believable opponent. Texano, even during the time when he was part of the invasion of AAA, he was the one that I least liked from the group. And the less I saw of him, the better. Nothing against him as a performer, but he's, I think what you call, what your opinion of Moose, to me, he's like a, just a charisma vacuum like it just it, it's something with him it just doesn't click and uh this did no did no different but it was a short match um Austin Aries got the win but that was just my biggest takeaway I just felt like this should have went to somebody else not Texano yeah yeah I, I mean I, I felt exactly the same as you when when all the uh triple a stuff was was coming in with these guys I couldn't stand Tejano and it wasn't because he was a good heel. I I just found him so bland. Nothing, no, no charisma about him, as you said, a vacuum. Uh, and nothing really changed my mind with this match. Um, interestingly enough, I thought, oh, do you know what? He looks in good shape. He's a big guy. He can move around. But as Don Callis pointed out on commentary, which I was surprised he did point out on commentary, Tejano gassed. And towards the end of the match, it, it looked like he could barely stand up. He was that, you know, tired. It was it was bizarre. It was really bizarre. And this is supposed to be their, you know, one of their top stars. And and to me, he came over as someone who hasn't wrestled much, it appeared to me. And you know what? There is one time and I can't recall, but somebody had pointed out what and they thought it was a bad look for impact during the time where they were having impact facing, you know, the best stars of impact, the main event guys are essentially facing the other company's mid card guys. And I don't know Texano's status in Mexico, but I mean, 
you know, he didn't, and to his credit, I'll tell you the one thing that he did do, which was pretty cool. I thought that promo that he cut backstage, I, I was impressed with it, even though I knew he wasn't walking out impact world champion i just thought that was cool but i think he just came across more as a mid card to me and i like i said i don't know what his status is in mexico if he wrestles on top of the card but if that is true what impact got to do a better job of is their top talent needs to be wrestling against and competing against the other promotions top talent it kind of makes our champion look less than when they're facing some mid or lower tier guy of another company in the main event I, I'm not sure if he's currently the champion, but I've got a feeling he has been the AAA world champion, and, and he could very well be the current one. But um, as I said, this this match, you know, it, it, it seemed to go very short and wasn't particularly impressive. What I do like, though, what, and, I'm gonna, and I know you guys have been talking about this, is I do like uh, Ares' entourage. And, you know, I know, I, I can't remember what you called them last week. You came up with a terrible name for the group. <laughs> the trio. Um, <laughs> the trio, yeah. Uh, but I, I, I think they're fantastic. And the one thing I, I do want to point out, because, you know, obviously I haven't been on this, this show for, for a few weeks, so I haven't really had a chance to talk about it, is is both Moose and Killer Cross are, are just playing their parts brilliantly. And, and it's not, it, it feels different to other stables, you know, where other stables are really concerned and, you know, are helping you know, the champion cheat and these kind of things. These two guys just seem like they're out there having fun, you know, and it looks like Killer Cross couldn't give a shit about what's happening to Austin Aries. And it makes me laugh, you know. Uh, it's almost like he looks at Aries and Moose in disdain every time. And I, I think it's brilliant. And Moose, oh, I've got to get myself one of those romper suits. I mean, that they're awesome. Uh, I want one of those. You know, yeah, I, I bet I, you've I, got one, bro. I, <laughs> you've got one, haven't you? I, I, I know that. <laughs> I noticed, though, with the group, though, you kind of see where you got Austin Aries. He's the braggadocious champion. You got Moose, well, dubbing himself Money Moose. He's the fly guy with all these suits. And then you got, you got Killer Cross, who's like the serious one of the bunch. Just on, on Money Moose, um, his first show as a full-blown heel was uh, the Twitch show. And he plays the heel very, very well. I mean, I, I don't know if it, it, it happens during these tapings as well. But, you know, on the Twitch show that he did, he kept on uh, trolling the, the audience. Like, for one point, he, he asked, you know, the audience to, to clear a big path so that he could throw someone over the barricade. So everyone <laughs> cleared. <laughs> and then he just flipped on the bird and threw the guy back in the ring. And, you know, he's been brilliant as a heel. And, you know, I, you, know you, you mentioned about Tahano, I, comparing him to how I used to feel about Moose. I, I've done a complete turnaround on Moose. Uh, since he's turned heel, He's been really entertaining, and and I began to really like him. Even the thing like you know the selfie with Mackenzie Mitchell backstage, it was all it's, it's all really good stuff. And he's finally found a character. It's the same you know we talk about Eddie Edwards and Matt Seidel, you know that them finding their characters finally after all these years. It seems to me that Moose has found his character. You know, I, all I just said, and I said it in previous pods, was I worry if that'll eventually be uh, doom him in the end because. You know, you take a top baby face, baby face challenger for the Impact World Championship, and not only you turn him, but you have him associated with the said champion. Like, you know, I wonder how how does that bode well? You know, bode for him down the road, eventually trying to compete for the title again. Well, I mean, you know, if, if uh, the one that springs to mind where there was a stable like this was was in WWE with Evolution, and that's where. Uh, Batista came from, wasn't it? You know, the Batista finally broke out of that bodyguard and went on to, to challenge for the title. And I can imagine that something like that will happen with either Moose or, or Cross at some point, you know, that they'll turn on the stable and, and, and be the top challenger. Uh, so, but yeah, I, 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 I had more worries when it was just Cross that he was going to be the gateway star to get to Ares. It doesn't feel like that kind of stable where people are going to have to go through these guys to get to to Aries it just doesn't it feels like they're just part of a stable and you know not you know not, not a barrier to get to the title because Aries is is just taking on all comers and I like what they're doing with Aries I really like what they're doing with Aries uh, and I also like the fact that they're not cheating to win although Aries did try to cheat <coughs> as it turned out it was only Tahano who ended up cheating uh, ironically in this match and still lost <laughs> so and still lost yeah <laughs> Uh, so anyway, uh, that was the main event. And then, of course, we had uh, the, the run-in by Johnny Impact, who, um, 
I mean, I, I found this really stupid. Again, you know, the, the the promo first of all. Then Aerie said, "Oh, I know what you're up to. You're here, aren't you? You're here." And he sent them all off to look for him. And then Johnny Impact just came down the ramp. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was stupid. Um, and I, I, oh, I just don't like Johnny Impact. I'm sorry, guys. I'm being negative tonight. I don't don't mean to be negative because Impact is brilliant at the moment. Uh, but you know, I just Johnny Impact's too cheesy for me. I, I'd rather have seen someone else in the main event. I know. I think we all feel the same. Yeah, you know what, I think the case with him, he's gotten so many opportunities, and I think let alone to, to have him main event a second Bound for Glory, like, you find yourself, or at least I find myself, like, he has to win, because if he doesn't win, he's going to keep getting shots, you know, let him hold the title, even if it's for a short period of time, and not that I, I'm not a fan of his, I like his work, but I just think he's gotten so many opportunities, I think they should have been pulled the trigger, let him get his reign and keep it keep it going. I think sacrificing another ma uh, main event for Bound for Glory with him in it, that opportunity should have went to someone else. Because Bound for Glory, I look, I look at Bound for Glory as a feel good story for some type baby face who's you know been trying to climb up the ranks and finally get that opportunity to win on the company's biggest stage or the, the biggest stage that they consider, and to give that opportunity to somebody who's already been there. I, I just feel like it does a disservice so but yeah with that said I just think it just it's tailor made for him to win and they're pushing him as the savior yeah uh, I hope you're wrong but I think that is the way that they're going to go and uh, although we said that about Moose as well didn't we at Slammy uh, we thought he was going to you know, the, be the feel good story and it didn't happen so uh, we'll, we'll see but yeah we'll, we'll, we'll see so you're quite right though about the main event though I don't think it should have been Johnny Impact I mean, Eli Drake, uh, for me, should have been the one in that spot, especially as it was quite random. And at this point, they know that Eli is going to be uh, staying around for a while. Now, the one disturbing thing that did come out of the media con that I went to uh, was my interview with Eli Drake. He was very vague about his contract extension. I don't know if you picked up on that in the interview. Um, yeah, but... I caught that. I caught that. He was very vague as to when it ran out and those kind of things. And I just have a fear that after Bound for Glory, he's gone. Because it seems to me what he was saying was the contract extension was taking him to Bound for Glory, is how it appeared to me. And bearing in mind, they haven't put him into any program as such. Uh, just random, you know, facing off uh, his open challenge. I, I do worry that he is going to be gone. I think there's a... <clears throat> excuse me, it might be just optimism on my end. I think there's a long-term goal, really, if you think about it, this whole open challenge, it's a way to rebuild him because I think he took a lot of damage even when he was champion. And we've talked about this ad nauseum on the cast where when he was champion, he took the back seat to Johnny Impact and uh, the name who won't be mentioned. Alberto. <laughs> yeah. I'll say it. Yeah. I'll say it. So, so I think this is really giving an opportunity to rebuild him. And I really think with the, the route that he's going to end up going, I think they're going to end up turning him babyface. And he's going to be the top babyface in the company. Because when you see him competing, he's not getting booed like how he might have been in years past like a lot of people whether they're going along with his chance or cheering for him so i think the long-term goal is to build him as a baby face and you know if if johnny impact is un unsuccessful capturing the impact world championship from austin aries you can do an austin aries versus eli drake and you got that story to build off of stemming back from when austin aries returned and took the title from eli yeah absolutely and um yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, one final thing I would say about the main event. You said about Tahano's promo. I really liked Austin Aries' promo. Hey, I looked it up what it meant. El Tahano, it means the Texan. <laughs> I just I just thought it was brilliant. <laughs> um, Aries has been killing it on the mic. He, he's been really, really good. Anyway, that, that was the end of the show. Uh, let's get back to the beginning. So we're in Mexico. And uh, we started off with, oh, as we always do, it's going to be a high-flying match, isn't it? And my only problem with this this match, before we get into it, was, well, it was OVE versus Aerostar, Hio del Vikingo, I think, and Laredo, uh, Laredo Kid. Now, the only problem with this match was that it felt like some of the old X Division matches in that sometimes it was just spot after spot after spot. And the wrestlers involved 
you know, put themselves in the position. Sometimes we just stood around for, you know, a couple of seconds waiting for the, for the moves to hit. Uh, and, uh, and although it was very good, it, it did feel very, very staged at points. How, how about yourself, Ro? What did you make of this? I notice at times that when we get these openers where whether it's a multi-man match, six-man tag variety, where it's really spot heavy. And while, you know, sometimes it kind of can suspend the belief of certain things. I like the thing that I like about a match like this is we knew the, the main point of this was to give OVE as a group a big win because we always talk about how with OVE it seems like it's Callahan and the Chris brothers really take a back seat and at times we see them they're really serving it more as lackeys than an actual tag team former tag team champions mind you so I think these matches give them an opportunity to reestablish themselves as a team as well and you know it gives their opponents you know just enough offense to get in to make it an honest match but yeah i have noticed that there that's kind of like the formula where you know it goes fast paced they do some dives and then one guy does a dive another guy does a dive another guy does a dive like and there's a lot of stalling at times kind of similar to and uh, bq mentions this a lot a lot at times when you have somebody doing a move off the turnbuckle instead of doing a move where it uh, uh, sets them up in position, the opponent who's going to take the move might roll over. So a lot of stuff kind of looks staged and choreographed. But with that said, you know, good fast-paced match. OV gets the win, looking strong heading to their match at Bound for Glory against the Lucha Brothers and Brian Cage. Yeah, absolutely. And um, th- there was one move that uh, was nearly botched where someone did the shooting, was it shooting star press or I can't remember what, but he, he looked like he was about to slip on the turnbuckle. Might have been a 450 splash or something. Uh, I can't can't quite remember. I don't know if you, you picked up on that, but no, it was a good high flying match. And OV and and uh, Sammy Callahan, are, are we allowed to call him OV? I don't know if we have to differentiate, but th- they were very, very good again, you know, and some of the stuff that I, I know, you're not a fan of Jake Chris, are you? Uh, the way that he was copying Sammy Callahan and those kind of things. But he, his kicks and his roundhouse kicks and things are really good. You know, I, I really like how he wrestles. And uh, I, I thought that they did a, a really, really good job. I like the, you know, the triple pile driver during the match. I thought that was a good spot. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure about the finisher. Uh, what they call it? The all-seeing eye? Is that what they, is that what they call it? The, it's like the cutter from the shoulders. Not, yeah, Don't they, that, they, they, and I will get into this later in another match, but I kind of have to jump on BQ's bandwagon with this. The cutter is probably the most overused move in Impact right now. I mean, and like I said, we'll get into it in the match with Phoenix. Like, you look at look at a move, and I, I guess you, this stems back from a while back because you think about the DDT where that used to be, uh, you know, once you hit it, that was it. And then it just became a transition move. The cutter is the most overused move in impact. Yeah, I noticed it this week, especially as you guys have been talking about it. But, you know, there was cutters all over the place. There was, you know, rolling cutters, flippy cutters. Uh, you know, it was all over the place. I tell you a move. I, I can't remember which, which one it was who did it. I think it might have been Laredo Kid, where he was thrown to the ropes and he ran to the ropes on his hands. That was that was an amazing spot. I don't know if you saw, you recall that at all. Yeah, I don't re- I don't remember, but I noticed with with some of them in this uh, back in when they were in Canada with the ramp, a lot of people utilizing the ramp. Now, while it's clever, I think sometimes once again it's easy to fall back into that stalling where you got somebody kind of waiting for them to run from off the ramp and do something off the ropes. And I just think, you know, while it's excellent, sometimes it just looks silly because it's like essentially you got somebody just waiting right there to take a move. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, so, uh, yeah, the match was good. The the crowd were good. Um, I, I think, once again, they haven't done a great job with the miking of the, of the crowd, but the crowd seemed lively and into it. And, yeah, it was, it was a good opener. It was it, it was a really good opener, except for, the, you know, the, as I said, a few things that annoyed me, like them getting into position for the moves and it felt a bit spot heavy at times. I still thought it, it was an excellent opener. And, uh, yeah, um, the Cal- uh, sorry, Callahan and OV were, were very, very good. So then we had a backstage promo, I think, with Matt Seidel and Rich Swan. Um, what, what do you think of these two guys and how they're working together? 
Now, I find it weird only because I thought we were seeing Seidel kind of move up the card some. I had been an advocate of him working the main event some because I felt like he did all he really could in the X Division. I know only being a one-time former X Division champion, but I thought it, you know, he was he's shown more than enough to move up so i think him feuding with swan kind of still keeps him in the x division at least for the time being but with that said i have no problem with it because we always talk about having feuds that don't resolve, revolve around championships and that's what we're getting with this what i find strange about rich swan is that i honestly thought he was going to be pushed to the moon and he doesn't seem to be pushed he's eating just as many losses as wins at the moment uh which is interesting uh but you know, I honestly thought he would have the X Division title by now. And uh, he's nowhere near it, is he? He's um, he's, he's just a, a mid-card jobber, almost. I wouldn't go that far. I think with him, though, and I hate to say this about guys, but his ceiling, I mean, can you see him doing anything other than X Division? I mean, maybe some tag team, but I think he's going to be a staple in the X Division, especially when you think about somebody departing like, Andrew Everett most recently you know they need somebody who's gonna can just do that just nothing but X Division and I think he's uh, tailor made for that talking of Andrew Everett uh, funny enough I, I asked Trevor Lee about Andrew Everett in my interview and he said yeah yeah he's still part of the roster and then a week later he's gone there you go thanks for that scoop Trevor uh, yeah. talking of which tre sorry go ahead no I'm sorry if I can just add in once again BQ did a fantastic job covering the, uh, the release of Andrew Everett. I think what makes it tough, and I think we are at a point now, like when we, we can see the writing on the wall for a lot of wrestlers on the roster when we don't see them or they compete else, elsewhere other than, than Impact. I just think you hate in the case of a guy like Andrew Everett where I think he was headed towards a significant push, but then the injury derailed him and then you know that after that he kind of just got lost in the shuffle and with impact only having one show i mean an injury can cost you your spot essentially so and i think that's what kind of probably messed him up in the end would you have liked to see everett stick around i mean i i always thought he he defines x division you know they kind of need that guy i mean not everybody's going to be able to evolve from the X Division and move up to the main event. You're going to have some guys and this goes back to even when you think about the old WCW Cruiserweight Division there were some dudes like a guy like a Psychosis for example where that was it, really it for him. He just stayed in that and I mean he was fine fine with that. Juventud Guerrero they were fine with that. So I think somebody like him, you knew what you were getting with him but uh, I, I really think that injury is what uh, ultimately messed it up for him. And I think that's what dooms a lot of people when somebody gets hurt or something, you know, heaven forbid happens with Impact only having one show in two hours to dedicate, like everybody's fighting for that same spot. So as much as we might clamor for like, hey, let's bring this guy in, you know, you think about the people we don't see, that's going to cost somebody their job in a, in a sense. Yeah, that's pretty much what Trevor Lee was saying during my interview with him, that he said that, uh, yeah, he wished he was doing more, but uh, at the same time, he's on TV. So he doesn't really <laughs> mind doing what he's doing. So, well, fair play to him. Talking of which, we had uh, Eli and Trevor up next during the Open Challenge. Now, I thought Eli was very good here. And as he said, you know, when we were talking about him at the beginning of the show, Eli is so over with the crowd. And it was it was the same in Manchester, you know, that we he was facing... I forgot his name, Joe Hendry. And um, Joe Hendry is obviously the local town hero. And uh, people were cheering for Eli. Everyone wanted to see Eli beat him. So, I mean, he's gone past that being a heel stage now. Just like The Rock got to that point where you can't be a heel anymore. And they have to turn him face. I, yeah, I really liked this match. And I thought it was competitive. It wasn't, even though I know it was relatively short, it, it wasn't uh, an essential squash. And I have no problem, <clears throat> excuse me, with the Eli Drake Open Challenge, as long as it leads to something at Bound for Glory. Because I think you can have the opportunity to do a plethora of things, whether you want to debut somebody, whether you want some surprise appearance, anything that you want to do, you can use the Eli Open Challenge to do that. And I thought one of the best things that they did, I want to say a couple or so ep episodes of Impact is how they debuted Stone Rockwell and the fact that even though you know it was a squash 
he was able to get promo time, introduce himself. We were introduced to a new member on the roster. So I think with this open challenge, there's so many different paths they can take with it while keeping Eli on TV, giving him wins, making him look strong, and rebuilding him as a potential world title contender in the foreseeable future. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, I, where I, I, when we do these reviews, I usually get up, uh, you know, one of the dirt sheets, their review of impact to go through things. And, uh, I, I usually go, I, I don't like to advertise other sites and those kind of things, but I usually go on to, to wrestling Inc. They do a good, good job of doing the review and it's usually on one page. However, they've changed a the reviewer recently. So if I miss anything out on the show row, you're going to have to keep me right because, um, the, the new reviewer on there is, is pretty awful at doing it. And I, I, looking at this, I watched the show yesterday and I can see there's a couple of segments that aren't you know mentioned in, in the review that I'm reading. So I'm going to dive in next and say there was a backstage segment with Tessa Blanchard. Now, I don't know if it happened at this point or later on, So, but let's just talk about it now. So we had Tessa Blanchard come in and act all high and mighty against someone that looked like Sexy Star. Uh, I don't think it was Sexy Star. Um, but uh, certainly a, a masked female wrestler and told her, you know, to get out of her spot, which was the most unglamorous spot I've ever seen in a locker room. It, it did feel like she was arguing over a little tiny cubby hole, but uh, she was then confronted by Fabi Apache out of her uniform. I, yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't recognize who the heck that was. And then until I seen the makeup, I mean, I, you know, later on, once we seen her wrestle, I was like, oh, okay. And uh, I thought it was interesting that they had the subtitles, because I think when they're one of, I don't want to say it was a concern, but I, you know, was wondering, I just said, with the language barrier, I know some of these wrestlers, some of them speak English, but some of them might not. Like, how do you, you know, go about doing the promos? And we seen later how they did it, which was a great job of doing that. So, um, and we'll, we'll get onto it later, but I kind of already had the idea that I was like, if not this show, but next show, she's going to challenge Tessa for the championship. And I was like, wow, you know, it's funny. <laughs> their first tapings in Mexico, all of a sudden, these people are just being gifted title shots. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, if you take in the, the show in, what, what's the word I'm looking for? As if it was a real show. What was funny is that obviously, you know, they're, they're making out that they're not filming it all on one night or over a couple of nights. They're doing it each week. Why was Tessa Blanchard even there? Because she didn't have a match on the show. <laughs> you know, so the logic went out the window with that one. But anyway. Uh, it was a fine segment. I, I, I love what Tessa's doing. I read something the other day uh, online and, and someone was going about, oh, they don't rate Tessa at all, you know, and they don't like her. And I'm thinking, I just don't get how you can't appreciate how good she is. She, she's amazing. Yeah, she got star written all over her. I mean, you know, who knows? I mean, everybody's opinion's different. Like, there's wrestlers that we might both like that others don't like, vice versa. And, I mean, it could be a scenario that they wanted her to sign for a certain, certain company. And whatever you might feel about Impact, you might feel if you don't like Impact, whoever signs there, you might not like them. So, who knows? But I think... She, you know, putting the tight on her while I kind of thought they should have saved it for it and made it a bigger deal. I think it was an excellent choice just for the simple fact you can rest assured we're going to see her on impact every week. And I think with our champions, whether they're competing or not, we need to see them on TV, whether it's some backstage promo or video vignette, anything. And I know with Tessa being knockouts champion, that's something we're guaranteed to see week in and week out. Absolutely. Now, one thing, uh, as I said, you know, I'm not sure the order of things happened because I watched a show yesterday and the review that I'm reading doesn't highlight it. So we had, we had a lot of stuff with the OGs and we'll go into the match in a second. But let's talk about the two backstage promos, first of all, of, um, you know, first the OGs with King and then the one with Conan. Well, have you got any thoughts on this at all? Okay, as far as with the OGs, I'm just at the point like, what's the end game? Only because in this feud, we've seen it be one-sided and i read somewhere that this match that they're having at bound for glory and it has to be an error because obviously we know it's a six-man tag but it said the tiles were on the line and i just find myself wondering you know are ogs gonna finally get their comeuppance because it's just been so one-sided but the star in all this has been king and you know i don't know what his contract status is i really wouldn't mind seeing him as an active performer you know, actually wrestling on the roster as opposed to him just being a manager. Like, I have no problem with him being in this role, but I really think he could add something to the roster if he was actually wrestling on a consistent basis. 
Well, we might get that after the feud's finished. We, we don't we don't know yet. So, but I know what you mean. You know, he, he's been fantastic in the role, and you know the, the stuff backstage that that he did was was good. Um, but I thought the stuff that Conan did backstage, I I, I don't know. Conan looked alive, and and uh, did, did you ever watch Lucha Underground? No, but I've I've followed Conan back in his old WCW days. That's why you know to see him in the state and i i noticed that too and i think he recently got surgery to prepare for this match so he did look fresh and he didn't look all like old and uh compromises we normally see him exactly in these, in, in these backstage segments so i'm just interested to see what what he can do I, I would love to see him just bust out the tequila sunrise again though yeah i, I mean I, I thought he was in this segment i thought that, a the promo was good but it does look like he's five years younger. I mean, I watched Lucha Underground. I mean, they're on season three, so I'm guessing it might be three, four years ago when it debuted. And, you know, he was backstage. I think he was um, uh, mentoring uh, Ricochet, whatever his name was uh, in it. I can't remember. But um, so he was mentoring him. And he looked like an old man. And, he, and he's looked like that since he's been in Impact as well, that a really old man who's seen it all uh, and is, is barely mobile. But in this... He looked five, ten years younger. I don't know what they're drinking down there in the water in Mexico, but uh, get me some. I tell you, I could do with it this morning. Um, yeah, so I, I thought that the, the promo was fantastic. Um, but, uh, yeah, <laughs> it was funny how he was talking about how people disappear if you break the ceasefire. <laughs> it's just, it's all very hokey for me, but I still quite liked it. Yeah, I thought it was very, very good. So, uh, before we move on to the match, any comments on on, on Conan uh, other than what we've already said? Yeah, I just I just want to see what he's able to do. Um, like I said, I was a fan of his as a little kid. He used to be able to go. I mean, obviously that was over twenty years ago. But yeah, I'm just interested to see what can he do. Can he do enough in the match where you know it's a passable event? I mean, if we've seen guys like Scott Steiner, you know, be given a role a limited role in matches where it's enough to make the match passable and that's all i'm hoping for yeah we talked about it earlier on about you know the fact of joking it's yet another hardcore match but just with a different name uh but do you think that they will go what's the word i'm looking for final deletion on it and i know that's a catch-all now for you know basically outside ring filmed stuff uh, a bit like they did with the last hardcore match the um, the one in the streets which LAX won again. Do, do you think they'll do something in the ring, or do you think it will be wholly pre-taped? You know what? I I really don't know. There's so many different ways they can go about it because they're dubbing it a concrete jungle. So I mean, to already do the outside, I mean, maybe what you could do is you can do something in the ring, but kind of have, <clears throat> excuse me, like the outside something that you would see in, let's say, the concrete jungle. You know, so, I mean, but at the end of the day, you're talking about some sort of hardcore match. So, but, uh, you know, I, 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 I think creative will come up with something special. Yeah, I, I think if they do a lot of pre-taped stuff, then they can hide some of Conan's, uh, you know, injuries and age-related issues. So uh, wouldn't surprise me if they do some, you know, where it starts off in the ring and then it spills backstage and the next thing they're brawling, you know, uh, around the Statue of Liberty and then, it cuts away that they're at the the Twin Tower Memorial, you know, things like that, and they're just basically all over New York at random points. But anyway, yeah, uh, the match itself, though, um, poor old Kronos, uh, who who basically got jumped on and then got a spinning back fist from King. Uh, at least it was a different finisher. But I, I I don't know why that they just didn't let King wrestle for a bit longer. I, I don't get why because he's he's obviously a wrestler, and he may be not in his peak physical shape, but you know, it just seems strange that they're, they're making out that all he could do was have someone else beat up the opponent and he, he just finishes them off. You know, I think what they're doing is because right now they're using him more in a role of a mouthpiece. But like like you had said, you know, maybe after all this ends, maybe he decides to come back as a wrestler, in which I'm hoping. Because, I, 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 like I said, I really think he can uh, bring something to the table that's not already on the roster. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, uh, I like what they're doing w with it overall, this, this program, you know, it's, it's been really, really good. 
in that uh, the LAX, the OGs. We've talked about, we've we got a feeling it might go three for zip at, at Bang for Glory. And where do you go with the OGs after that? It feels like it's now coming. It has to come to an end. I can't really see the feud going on past Bang for Glory. Could you? No, I mean, it's just, you, they, they've been on, the, and even too, if you look at it, where if the OGs were to finally win, then, you know, obviously would be next would be a title title shot. That's why I kind of I'm hoping that at these tapings that LAX drops the titles, maybe due to OG interfering or whatever. That way, this feud, there's no titles involved because them going in, in going into Bound for Glory tag team champions and the tag team titles not being defended. That kind of bothers me because I believe that the big show, they need all the champions need to be defending their championships and when you're involved in a match and this is a six-man tag match where obviously you can't put the titles on line i mean i guess you could if you were taking complicated measures but essentially you can't you know that you know tag titles aren't being defended and i don't like that no well i, I was going to say you know for all the good the creative are doing you know they, they've really screwed up the title scene uh, on impact you know brian cage is not defending his title uh, well, we don't think he is unless they turn that into a six-man match, you know, where the title's on the line forever gets the pin, which I hope they don't do that. But I suppose it's one game of getting the title off Brian Cage without him getting pinned. Um, same with the tag titles, you know, and, and all these things, you know, you, it's your main pay-per-view. So you're going to have six, seven matches on it, aren't you? I'm guessing uh, something like that. And so you, you don't defend these titles very often anyway. So what? I, I just don't get why they're putting the title holders in these matches when well, there's other people on the, on the spot who could have them. So with LAX, for example, they should have dropped the title so that KM and the Desi hit squad, etc., could, could, have, could fight over it with, with Brian cage. He shouldn't be in that match. Anyone could have taken the place for the Lucha brothers uh, with the Lucha brothers. It didn't need to be him. It could have been anyone. Um, you know, it could have been the Mumbai cats for, for all intended purposes. It doesn't really matter. You know, it didn't need to be Brian cage, but here we are, you know, um, uh, unless they want to just use Bound for Glory as a stepping stone to get a Callahan Cage feud going. Well, I um, think I think the last thing I'll add on it is, if you're going to have one match where the titles aren't going to be defended, fine. But to have two matches on the card where champions aren't defending their championships, I think that's a bad look. So I'm fully expecting, or hoping I should say, that at these tapings, or these set of tapings, that either LAX or Brian Cage drops their title. That way we can see either the tag championships or the X Division Championship defended on Bound for Glory. I would lean more towards if I had if you asked me to choose, I would say the X Division because essentially it's our default mid card belt and I think that needs to be defended at a big pay per view as such as Bound for Glory. The other thing that you've got as well, the other problem that you got is that with all of these guys facing off in two six-man matches that's 12 guys off the roster in two matches you actually haven't got that big a roster to fill out the rest of the card so uh, you know i i don't know what they're doing with bang for glory and you know it, it always I, I don't understand how it always seems the problem because slammiversary is usually booked quite well and the lead up to it whereas slammiversary uh, sorry bang for glory the last three four years have been quite poorly booked and the lead up to it and, and they've got no excuse. They've, they've really got no excuse. I, I just don't get it. But anyway, I don't want to be down on, on Impact because generally I, I enjoy the show and, and I like the programs. It's just that some of this logic just doesn't make sense, you know, of the guys involved in these matches when they should be, you know, either not be the belt holders or or um, or drop them. So uh, moving on. Up next, we had, I think it was Alicia versus... Fabi, uh, Fabi Apache. Now, before I tell you what I think, what, what did you make of this? I mean, it was just a way to put over Fabi. I mean, I think if anything, we look at the post-match angle. I think that was a thing that was probably the biggest takeaway that uh, you know sets up a title match against her and uh, Tessa Blanchard. Okay, I, I'm going to be controversial on this one. Um, well, first of all. The match went really long for what was essentially two people who I don't give a shit about. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I don't know why they gave so much time to this. And they actually give less time to the main event than this, I think. I think this was maybe the longest match of the night. Um, but the thing I was going to say that I'm going to be unpopular about here is I was really disappointed with, with Fabi. And I'm going to come over as a complete jerk here and a, 
and someone who who's most the word of like a misogynistic in that when I saw the still images of Fabia, I thought she's going to be stunning. And when she came out, I was actually quite disappointed in how she looked. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not into fat shame or anything like that, but I was actually really disappointed. I thought she was going to be some six foot tall Amazonian woman, you know, uh, red Indian woman with, I don't know if that's the correct term, native American. Oh, sorry. Sorry if I've offended anyone. Don't mean to. Um, but, but she came out and she just looked odd. She just didn't look like a wrestler or look menacing. She is, you know, she came across <clears throat> to me. I mean, I didn't look at her in that light, but she just seemed like a regular person on the roster. And once again, like I said, you know, we're having our champion, you know, in Tessa Blanchard facing somebody who, you know, are given a tight opportunity to somebody who, you know, looks like they're, you know, mid to lower tier type wrestlers. Like with Impact in Mexico, Impact wrestlers should be facing Mexico's best, not the enhancement people or you know the lower tier i want our champions and our wrestlers to face they're the best that mexico has to offer and she just doesn't strike me as somebody as the top now like i said i don't follow the promotion that promotions that she wrestles for for all i know she might be the top top person i i don't know and if i'm wrong i apologize but i just think that's where it just came across and you know for her to get the title shot i was just like you know, kind of like, oh, okay, I guess. Yeah. I, I, and j just to reiterate, uh, apologies if I used the wrong terms then would, when describing her heritage. Uh, I, I'm an old white dude, you know. you, you got to expect I'm going to be out of touch with what I'm supposed to say. So apologies, no offence meant. Um, but going back to, to the promo with Tessa Blanchard that she did at the beginning, that was another problem I had with her. And I didn't mention it when we talked about the promo. But as you said, you didn't know who she was. And, and she turned up wearing a flat cap and a T-shirt. And... You know, if she's got an Apache gimmick, then why is she backstage wearing a T-shirt and a flat cap? She should have been in an Indian, Indian headrest address at that point when she confronted her because it, it seemed like a random person backstage who was actually very small as well, uh, very short, um, you know, confronting Tessa. And until she came out, I didn't know who that was, as you said, you know, who was confronting Tessa. Yeah, I was unfamiliar with her. And yeah, it did come across as random because then it, you can look at it as... Te why is Tessa backing away from this random person? Once again, like I said, and not that I'm looking too much into it, my big thing is, you know, when Impact does these shows where they're going to other promotions, we can't have our top tier talent, you know, ones that we, you know, we have in the main event or working high up the card, you know, really kind of going 50-50 with the lower tier talent. I mean, if this that's the case, if I don't know, like I said, I don't know how she, her status is, where she wrestles at but you know tessa needs to dominate this match well, one thing i did like in this match was uh the commentary uh, oh by the way the commentary it didn't feel like it was live again if you remember when seidel and um sonjay were doing it they, they kind of recorded it afterwards and this had that feeling of they weren't actually in the arena while it was being filmed i don't know if you got that impression as well or not i, I didn't catch that i mean they've you know Callis and, and uh, Josh have done a fantastic job. I've really enjoyed Don's commentary. I mean, he just adds a different new life to the to the booth. Well, yeah, he does. Uh, oh, by the way, the, the Bound for Glory hat, did, did it fit on his head? It, <laughs> <laughs> it just seemed like it was sitting on top of his head as opposed to actually being, you know, probably fitted. It was weird. <laughs> but anyway, the, the one bit of commentary he did in this match, which, which had me in stitches again, was... Uh, when Fabi was doing the um, a Mexican surfboard, and Josh asked, which part of the body does this hurt? And as he said it, she was kind of launched forward onto her face and, and Don went, uh, yeah, that, that, that's the bit that hurts your face. <laughs> Which I, I thought was very good timing on the commentary. But um, yeah, uh, I, I wasn't at all impressed by, by is it Fabi or Fabi? I don't know. I, Fabi. I don't know. <laughs> Fabi or Patrick. Yeah, uh, I, I wasn't impressed by her. And I, I did like the fact that they, gave her a translator in the ring afterwards um but uh, you know to do a bit of a promo but i'm not am i looking forward to seeing her versus tessa nah not really you know and i and i really can't see tessa losing this match um but hopefully the effort next week will be slightly better right okay so uh we had a, a, a tejano and mckenzie mitchell promo 
Um, oh, one thing we didn't talk about when we talked about the main event was when Aries looked at Mackenzie Mitchell and said, I thought you got fired, uh, which was quite funny. Yeah, he always has he has some quick jabs, man. He's been a, a great champion, man. And then uh, we had uh, Scarlett Bordeaux do a little tease that next week she's going to have a big announcement or a big reveal or something. I don't know what that can be. What do you reckon that's going to be? I don't know, but for the first time seeing this, well, I mean, seeing her uh, when she was doing her little dance, it had me thinking about what you were saying. How it seems like she tries so hard to be sexy. And I think the thing with her, she did it around the ring on Explosion not too long ago. And I feel who she plays and who she is, it's really night and day because in her interview that she had, with uh, Josh, the round the ring, she just comes across as just a simple down to earth type person. So I think seeing that and then seeing her playing this real conceited character, and when I, when I see her, you know, like you have mentioned in the past, her trying to be sexy, like it it was apparent to me for the for the first time. Good, I'm glad you're coming around to my way of thinking there. Good, <laughs> <laughs> no Bobo this week, unfortunately. Uh, he's the star of the show. Um, anyway, yeah, so moving on, we had uh, a, another tag match, this this one, which was uh, the Lucha Brothers versus Seidel and Swan. Uh, this was this was a good match, but once again, it uh, and this is the problem that I've had with the show overall, it just seems everything is is choreographed much more when, you, when you've got Mexican wrestlers or, you know, Lucha-type wrestlers. And this was another one where it just felt like the spots were happening, and I think there was a point where... Uh, I think uh, Rich Swan kind of shimmied his way into position so they could do, um, you know, a shooting star press on him. And it, it just annoys you when you see things like that. To me, the, you know, the match was good. I mean, at first I cr- cracked a little joke to myself. I said, wow, the Lucha Brothers, they never lose in impact. So, you know, darn well, they're not going to lose here. But once again, I'm going to bring back that cutter. Like Phoenix, man, I mean... It was getting to the point where I was sick of seeing the move, like the the usage of it, like every every other move that he was doing was a cutter. Like, I mean, overall, you know, they the Lucha Brothers, they're a great team, but I kind of like Pentagon working as a singles wrestler. I think he adds more, and I think you know with it, the team of you know when he's teaming with Phoenix, I don't want to say it brings him down a little bit, but I just think he could be doing so much more. But, yeah, you see that a lot. It seems in Phoenix's case where things just seem so choreographed and there's a lot of waiting around, waiting to take a spot. And, you know, there's only so much that you can do that. But not to take anything away from the match, these we know what we're getting anytime the Lucha Brothers wrestle. And Rich Swan and Seidel didn't really expect them to have too much chemistry since they seemed to kind of be at odds. Although those stereo Frankensteiners that they pulled off, I thought that was uh, magnificent. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I just thought it was, was it the, I think it was match of the night. Most prob- it was match of the night, wasn't it? Let's face it. Um, it was It was very good. But then again, uh, I wasn't very high on, on any of the other matches except for the opener. But th- this was by far the best match of the night. So, uh, yeah, they go on and they're going to be facing... Oh, no, I'm just trying to think. Um, was there a run-in at the end? Or I can't remember. What happened at the end of the match? <clears throat> we get our OVE. They go into for the attack and then Cage comes out to run them off. That's right. I, I, knew, I knew something happened. And I was reading the review here and it didn't even mention it in the review. And that, that's how bad this writer is on Wrestling Inc. <laughs> if Wrestling Inc. Are, are, are listening, please get, ri- get the old writer back. They were much better. Yeah, they gave a proper uh, run there. So, yeah, so Brian Cage, yeah, I, I, yeah, I thought I, I didn't imagine it. He came running in at the end and he'd save him. And uh, I don't know. <laughs> what they're doing with Brian Cage just, it seems wasted. It just seems wasted. This guy it is a phenomenal athlete. And he's been thrown into this six-man tag match just randomly. And maybe it's because they feel they need star power to go up against Sammy Callahan because the luchas can't talk, but why throw in someone else who doesn't talk in with two other guys who don't talk? It, it, it just, it's crazy. I mean, why, why not throw Eli Drake in there as an example? Because he could talk for the Lucha Brothers, you know, and he could make it really entertaining and he's not doing anything. Whereas Brian Cage, so you've got two guys who can't speak English and you've got Brian Cage who doesn't talk. It, it's, it's nuts. And Brian Cage is a title holder. 
you know, to, to me, why is Brian Cage in this spot? I, I, I just don't get it. I just don't get it at all. Yeah, anyway, and you know what? It's just, over. He, he, he's just, I think he's a big enough star where he should have his own match. You know what I mean? It's let alone since he's champion. I think if you would have had somebody and not, not a, a knock on him, but like just say Trevor Lee, for example, if he was X Division champion, I think you can get away with it a little bit. But I think with Brian Cage, from what we've seen thus far and him being undefeated and all these things that he has going on, he should have his own match, whether it's a one on one, a multi man, he should be defending his title at Bound for Glory. Maybe he'll do double duty. Who knows? Right. Um, then we had this uh, promo, as you said, about uh, Austin Aries with Mackenzie Mitchell, Money Moose, and Killer Cross. And it was nice seeing Mackenzie back, and she looked amazing. She looked amazing. Yeah, I mean, you know, it seems that in certain locations, I'm guessing Canada, we get uh, Alicia, and then I get, I'm guessing everywhere else we get Mackenzie. So it's pretty cool. You know, change it up a little bit. Yeah, and, and as I said before, Moose just looks awesome in his, his uh, multicolored Jackson Pollock uh, romper. And if anyone knows where they can get one for me, then please do. You know, we don't, we don't ask for, for money to subscribe to or pay for this show. But if any, you know, there's a sugar daddy out there who wants to buy me a multicolored romper, I, I'm not proud. I'll take it. It's awesome. <laughs> so not even so, a sugar, not even a sugar mama. You say sugar daddy, huh? <laughs> <laughs> hey, to each hey. his own. <laughs> I, I said I'm an old white dude, you know, I, you know, I'm out of touch. I'm trying to touch, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting in touch with my, you know, feminine side here. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm equal opportunities if people want to spoil me. <laughs> I'm all right with that. I'm comfortable. Right. Um, next up, we had Joe Hendry's new music video. And um, yeah, it's, it's funny. I really want to like Joe Hendry. And at the moment, he's just not connecting with me. I, I don't know what it is. I, I feel like I want to like him more than I do. And I know BQ is a, is a big fan. And, but I don't know. It's just something missing at the moment. And these music videos, this wasn't the best one. And why did they film it in a car park? It just felt like it was at a, in, a, in a car park at night. They just decided to film this. It, it, it wasn't the best one that they've done. Although I did like the punchline where he's in my top three friends as opposed to be my best friend. I mean, there's no problem with it because, you know, he's still relatively new. You know, you want to give him time to kind of work his way up through the ranks. But Impact, if Impact's listening, please don't ever show or at least give some type of warning, bleed it, uh, bleep it out. But Grado shirtless on a pole. I don't ever want to think, see, or those words should ever be the same sentence again. <laughs> You're right. Um, so anyway, that, it, it was a bit of fun, and at least it kept the guys in our minds, even if they're not really involved in anything at the moment. Did you think that at some point they are going to be a tag team, or do you think it will be a feud? Maybe this is what's going to happen. It's going to be a feud for Bound for Glory. And if you're Joe Hendry, would you really want your first Bound for Glory to be against Grado? I don't know. I, I think what they'll end up doing, they might partner for a little bit and then probably just decide to go their separate separate ways. Yeah, hopefully, it, yeah, hopefully they do something different. I mean, they, they already surprised me that they didn't turn Joe on Grado already when Katarina did. That surprised me. And it would surprise me again if at some point they don't turn on each other. I, I just hope they do go their separate ways and wish, wish each other luck and, you know, uh, uh, j just, just do something different. All right. So um, we had the induction into the Wrestling Hall of Fame, Impact Wrestling Hall of Fame. Was this any surprise to anyone, really? Wait, we missed one thing, if you just want to touch on it, the backstage with the Desi Hit Squad. Oh, yeah, yeah. As I said, it wasn't in my things, but yeah. <laughs> I, I like this. And it was great to see the return of a much-loved, uh, I mean, much-loved WWE star. Uh, I don't know if you spotted them in this segment. No, who? Moppy. Oh, oh. <laughs> I always wonder what happened to Moppy. I thought, I thought they went into the wood chipper. But Perry Saturn's Moppy was was being thrown around by uh, by Singh as he berated the Desi Hit Squad yet again. Uh, actually, this was one of their better promos. I've got to say, this was better than usual. Yeah, I mean, it it was fine for what it was. I mean, you know, I really thought, you know, think I should say, I'd really love for them to kind of just hot shot the tag titles on them, and then maybe you can have the Desi Hit Squad face 
you know, whether it's a KM, a follower, or some type of team, that way the belts can get defended. But, I mean, you know, with only a couple weeks leading the Bound for Glory, something would have to happen relatively quick for that to come into fruition. Uh, unfortunately, I, I think that this, the, the title scene that we see at the moment is is the way it's going to go. And now, by the way, just listeners, I know we've been pulled up once before about spoilers and those kind of things. That, I have not looked at the spoilers. I have not looked at any of the spoilers. In fact, I was actually quite surprised how few spoilers came out. I didn't see them on any of the usual sites. So, um, But the reason I'm saying that is that usually it does get spoiled, doesn't it, if there's a title change, usually by impact. So that, that's the only reason why I'm saying that. But who knows? You know, I don't know anything, uh, and it, it's not me revealing anything. So, um, yeah, but you're right. I, I, I think Kem and Falabar deserve it. You know, they deserve to have the tag titles. And, and to some extent, the Desi Hit Squad, you know, like – They've grown on me a little bit. I'll be honest with you, they've grown on me. And, and I like the guys involved in it, apart from Gamma Singh. Um, but, yeah, it, it was weird that he was carrying a mop around, wasn't it, to hit them with. And I, I know he's used the brush before, but it was almost like, he's got to hit them with something. What's around? Oh, there's a mop bucket over there. Go on, we'll use that. Um, so, anyway, p- poor old Dizzy hit squad. Um, hopefully that something um, something major will, will be able to help save save this, this stable, because... As we talked about, you know, dead on arrival before, the, the, there's a glimmer of hope there, but it, it's still not quite there. Agreed. Right. So, yeah, Abyss into the Hall of Fame. And actually, actually sorry, before we do that, before we do that, the GWN flashback, I don't know where it was on the show, but you guys, when I, I haven't been on the show, and, and you've talked about it a lot of times when I, when I was doing the reviews earlier on in the month and things about not showing the whole match. Damn you. Damn you, Ro. I was really enjoying this match, and I didn't see the bloody end of it. <laughs> They've listened to you. Well, I, go get the app. <laughs> <laughs> they finally listened to you, and it was the first time I've watched one of these things in quite some time. I was enjoying it. I wanted to see what happened to Matt Bentley, whoever he is. Um, yeah, to see what happened in this match. So, uh, yeah, thanks for that. But it, was was Matt Bentley someone else at some point? Or was he's he just a, Matt? He's the cousin of uh, Shawn Michaels. The, one of his his biggest uh, claim to fame, I remember he, I don't know if he was a multi-time, but he had an angle where him and Kazarian, because they used to be, a, I think they were a tag team, I'm not sure, but they both won the X Division uh, title, so they were cold holders of the X Division championship, so they were running that, but you know, the mid two, the mid 2000s and TNA during that time, their X Division was just loaded and um, you know you had very you know various guys. I mean it was just it was crazy. But it, no, he he was a formidable formidable guy, former X Division champion. But yeah, he uh his whole thing he uh, he went before as uh, Michael Shane, so Shawn Michaels, Michael Shane, Super Kick, all this and that. But yeah, he was fine. Yeah, I've, j- I've just looked him up here, and uh, he used X Division twice, title. He had match of the year in two thousand and three three versus Chris Sabin. Frankie Kazarian, there you go. Um, I and the first Ultimate X match, memorable moment of the year, two thousand and three. Although we obviously didn't see the memorable moment because they cut it off. Anyway, <laughs> back 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 to where we were. Impact Hall of Fame, Impact Hall of Fame. So Abyss. What? It was interesting seeing him at the beginning of his career in TNA. I didn't realize that he wrestled without the gear on. Abyss. His I would I want to say from. <clears throat> excuse me the the initial when the company actually started up until i want to say probably 2010 or so abyss was that guy i mean the way that they used him he was a true monster but we know in wrestling a lot when we have these monster characters there's kind of a shelf life because eventually the somebody's gonna slay the monster and then someone else is gonna slay the monster then after so many losses the monster isn't as monstrous so um but yeah, you know, I think this was a great selection. Um, I recommend anybody who, you know, oh, before I you know, give the recommendation, credit to him too for being able to reinvent, reinvent himself because he went from the monster then to the psychiatric ward. And then I thought the stupid Hall of Fame ring, I think that was terrible when they used him like that. Then we seen him in the revolution and then um, not too long ago with Decay, which I really thought he did some of his best work. You know, he, he's been great and loyal to the company when 
you know, when everyone else was departing and he had opportunities to jump ship. And I think at one time they had him pegged to face Undertaker. I don't know if it was at Mania, but he remained loyal. And it's a shame that he didn't, I don't want to say he didn't achieve a lot, but you know, he, someone like him should have been a multi-time world champion. And the only time he won the belt, and we covered this on the TNA throwback, I believe, is uh, the one, or no, I'm sorry, it was one of the trivias where he won via disqualification. And it's a silly way to win a, a world championship, but that was his reign. So, you know, I, I recommend anybody, to uh, anyone who's a BIS fan to go back and watch his stuff from the mid-thousand. I mean, Abyss, especially when he was uh, not as heavy, I mean, he was he's pretty incredible. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, it, it, as I said, it was interesting seeing him uh, debut as Justice in one of the clips he showed, but also uh, he, he bled a lot, didn't he? Uh, he used to bleed a lot. And it just goes to show how wrestling has changed for the better, I might add. Uh, I suppose I better throw that in there, hadn't I? But no, well deserved. And it, it's not often you get company guys anymore, is it? You know, um, you know the last big one was, would have been Sting, who, who was a company guy up until uh, he went over to the E and then got jobbed out to uh, Triple H. <laughs> Ah, good times, good times. Anyway, yeah, where were we? So, yeah, well done to Abyss. Uh, thoroughly deserved. And, uh, yeah, um, I, I think it was the right choice, bearing in mind who they could go with. I mean, I'd like to have seen a bit of a surprise from out, outside. But, you know, it is what it is. And there, and there, there isn't really many people on the roster who, who could have got it, who, who was still kicking around. Maybe Sanjay, but do you really want to put someone like Sanjay in there? I don't know. You don't want to put anyone, I thought not, they don't want to put anyone who's currently actively wrestling. I think to make the Hall of Fame hold some type of merit is it needs to be people who are actually retired. I think it's silly to have somebody who's actively wrestling and you got them like, yeah, they're in the Impact Hall of Fame, but they're wrestling tomorrow night, da, 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 you know, <laughs> to, I mean, at least in my eyes, it doesn't make much sense. Absolutely. And, and that's it, because then we were into main event territory, and we, we've already covered it. So, uh, yeah, that, that, that's us for the show. Uh, a, any final thoughts on the show before we uh, round up and have a look at what's happening next week? Okay, uh, not, as far as the show, like I said, I thought it was fine. I mean, there was really nothing must-see in my eyes, but uh, there's always next week. And, you know, next week's card, everything except one particular match, I'm not, I mean, I'm looking forward to. But, um if you don't have any other thoughts, I'll run down the card real quick. Yeah, let's go for it. Okay, so we're going to get a knockouts championship match between Tessa defending her knockouts championship against Fabi Apache. We also get the Desi Hit Squad facing LAX. So that should be interesting. Maybe there's some uh, title implications in that. We're also getting Jake Chris versus Brian Cage. I'm interested to see how that goes. That's a interesting clash of styles. And here's a match that I'm highly critical of. We're getting Ali and Kiera Hogan versus Sue Young and the Undead Maid of Honor. And I want your thoughts on this. How many times do we need to get this match? To me, this just comes across as straight lazy booking. I mean, we've seen this happen two, three, four different times, and it's always the same result. And we talked, I know most recently BQ and I had talked about with Ali and the direction that they have with her. They don't know if they want to have her feud with Tessa or continue to feud with Sue Young. And then as far as with Sue Young, we don't know what we're doing, they're doing with her. You got Kiera Hogan playing follower. You know, we only see her compete when she's tagging with Ali facing Sue Young. And then the undead maid honor is the undead maid honor. But I just thought this was lazy. I thought they could have done... You know, even if they would have done Kara Hogan versus the Undead Maid of Honor or Kara Hogan versus Sue Young, it's something fresh. But to give us the same match that we've seen two, three, four different times, I just thought that was lazy. What are your thoughts? Yeah, yeah I, I agree. The only thing saving grace about it is that um, it's some, it makes Ali's matches bearable by having uh, Udmod in there. Uh, in that she's by far the best wrestler, Casey Spinelli. So. Uh, to some extent, you know, it improves the quality of the match, but you're quite right. And by the way, I, I think that is her official name, Udmod, the undead maid of honor. Uh, Udmo, Udmo. I saw it on a graphic, and she's referred to as Udmo. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know. U-D-M-O-H, there you go. <laughs> so, 
I don't know if that's something that they're going with or they just couldn't fit undead, you know, a maid of honor on the graphic. But there you go. Um, yeah, so it's good to see uh, Casey Spinelli back, you know, once again in that role. I just kind of wish that, as you say, they do something different. It, it just feels like filler, doesn't it? You know, it, it feels like, oh, we're going down to Mexico. They love this undead shit. Let's 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 give them <laughs> let's give them a Sue Young match randomly thrown in there. And that's the problem you got with Sue Young, isn't it? You know, what do you do with her now that she hasn't got the title? Um, you know, did she just keep putting people in coffins? Maybe she should get rid of uh, Alicia. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, so anyway, so uh, yeah, um, show this week disappointed for what I thought was going to be a landmark show. You know, coming from Mexico, I thought everything was going to be you know fantastically hot crowd and you know the match was going to be awesome but it, it it was like a filler it was a filler episode of impact wasn't it? it nothing major happened on this show um that that you know has any grave consequences going forward you know and, and that and that's disappointing yeah because you know i was just really excited it's coming from canada where canada i can't applaud them anymore you know just gushing over them as far as the crowd and just the shows and then you come here and it just didn't to me in my eyes it just didn't feel like a actual impact wrestling show it seemed more of like you said mentioned a, a twitch show so that's this week's show and uh what i'd ask is is make sure you you do leave us some comments we would love to hear your questions to give us something to chat about next week uh, before we kick off the review also the trivia question just a quick reminder it was who what was the name of the tv show uh that had two stars featured going up against chris adonis and eli drake last year i think it was before slammiversary last year might have been it might have been you know a few months before a few months after i can't quite remember but we had two bodybuilders appearing on the show who had a brief feud which i don't think ever went to a match or anywhere uh against chris adonis and eli drake what was the name of their tv show and uh yeah hit the subscribe but uh for me and Ro. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time. Don't forget to leave a thumbs up. And for more from the Impact Lounge, check out the videos below.